When people explore the omnipotence of God, it usually proceeds in two phases. In the first, the expanse of his all-powerfulness is defined and then marveled at. The Bible speaks of the Almighty God who has unlimited authority to create at will and to cause anything that he wants to happen, to happen. He is in complete sovereign control of all that exists. Our human experience, however, leads us to a second phase of exploration, and that's asking questions that life brings up in our mind. The chaos of the world and the suffering in our lives seems to stand in contradiction to this portrayal of the almighty loving God. We look at the troubles in our world and wonder why doesn't God do something about this? At a more personal level, we suffer incredible pain and sadness from the things that happen in our life. And in our darkest moments, we allow ourselves to ask, why does the God who loves me allow things to hurt me in this way? The billions of lives in the world make this list of questions endless, but they can all be summarized in this way. If God is truly all-powerful, then why doesn't he do something about pain and suffering? When we haven't thought through the matter, the conclusions that we come to are sobering. Perhaps God can't do something about these troubles because he, he lacks the power. Or the worst conclusion, he won't do anything about this suffering because he lacks compassion or concern or something of that nature. There's a third option though, and that's where we're going to explore in this episode of 167. Suffering has been a part of the human experience since the moments after the confession in the garden. The story is known well to Christians from Genesis chapter 3, where a new reality dawns for the human race. God had created a world in which his creatures would, would rule. They would have dominion over everything in the world. Labor and exertion were a part of that world. We would till and care for the garden. They were not seen as penalties, but simply part and parcel of our regency. When sin enters the picture, though, aspects of the human experience gained a negative sense. God said to Eve, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain, you will bring forth children. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband's, but he shall rule over you. Turning to Adam, he said, Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. This is the often forgotten legacy of human life in this world. This is a far different experience from the utopia that we sometimes allow ourselves to fantasize about. Addressing the questions of suffering in relation to the Almighty God, well, that demands clear eyes and a realistic heart. I'm Pastor Warren Rochelle from Hope Community Church, and today, we're going to address questions about suffering in the Christian experience. Answering the question of why there's pain and suffering is more complicated than we think. Uh, to be sure, the very good world that God created, um, it was subjected to frustration by the actions of humankind. When sin 
um, you know, what we call human rebellion, when sin intrudes on that very good world, suffering and pain are the consequence. That's the simple answer to the question. Why is there pain? Because we brought it about. As simple as that is, the issue is far deeper and more nuanced than a simple answer can give. Pain and suffering are the realities of life, but not all pain and suffering are the result of sin. As hard as this is to hear, some pain is good. When you labor too hard, for example, or, or you spend too much time exercising, your muscles hurt. They have pain. Believe it or not, that's a good pain. It's a reminder uh, of our human limitations, the way our bodies are fearfully and wonderfully made, but they have limits. And we're wise to recognize those limits. The law of gravity that we probably almost never think about, boy, it comes to our attention when we trip and fall, doesn't it? As you probably have experienced in your life, even a minor fall can result in significant pain and long-term suffering. So we have to keep both sides of this discussion in our minds. We have to hold them in tension at the same time. But today our interest is turned towards the kind of suffering that results from sin and the corruption of the world. Our uh, unspoken question, you know, why doesn't God do something about suffering? Well, it has an answer that requires theological insight. If suffering, think about this, if suffering is a consequence of sin, well, then eradicating suffering requires the removal of the source of that sin. This is done either by sin or redemption. So why is the omnipotent God limited to just these choices? Well, because his character is not one-dimensional. He is um, not only the almighty God, but also the God of perfect love and at the same time, the God of perfect justice. He is, uh, he is of unmatchable mercy and he also bears a, a furious wrath. God cannot just make suffering disappear without also excising the sinners who generate that suffering. Now, this doesn't mean that we are completely without hope. At the final redemption, suffering will end and eternity will be marked by the lack of pain and the absence of tears. I haven't mentioned this, but the question, why doesn't God do something about suffering? Um, that's false reasoning for the Christian. God has done something about suffering. He did it in Jesus, in the Jesus crucified and resurrected. That moment in history initiates the demise of suffering for those who will put their faith in the Almighty God to restore the shalom in the world. When we understand the source of suffering as emanating from the corruption of the shalom, the intrusion of sin into the peace of the perfect creation, um, our questions turn towards purpose. It's natural for human beings to despair in the face of suffering and pain, especially when we have this feeling that it serves absolutely no purpose. For the Christian, this takes the form of the thoughts that God allows the righteous to suffer unnecessarily. Once again, the theology that answers this question requires that all aspects of God's character be considered, not just his omnipotent ability to either rid the world of pain or to protect believers from the effects of suffering. If we borrow from an out-of-context quote, um, Genesis chapter 50, 
Joseph informs his brothers of a revelation that he discovered in the midst of his suffering. He says to his brothers, um, who were the cause of his pain, As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. The omnipotent God, uh, he remains in control, and the Bible records numerous instances where God uses suffering and pain that we might perceive in a negative sense for either an individual good or an even greater good on the part of all humankind. Coming to understand that is a turning point in our comprehension of suffering and in our maturity as followers of Christ. So what purposes might God have in uh, his mind when putting us through suffering? One of the predominant uses of pain and suffering in the life of a Christian is Christ-likeness and the formation of that in us. Um, some suffering may be judgment for sin, and this shouldn't catch us by surprise. What it should have is the effect of turning our hearts towards repentance, of um, humbling us in turning our attention back towards obedience. When you read the book of Job, it's clear that God uses suffering to test us as well. Uh, he uses it to bring us to a deeper examination of our faith and a deepening of that faith in the midst of enduring suffering that life has brought. Pain contributes to the shaping of our souls. God can use our suffering to teach us and to uh, build our patience. Perhaps the most painful experience is God's uses of suffering to purify us, to burn off the dross of impurity um, in, this, in this crucible of pain in order to make us holy. One of the purposes of suffering that requires the most reflection is that God can use pain to further his own glory. The Apostle John uh, recounts an interaction in his gospel in um, chapter 9 um, where the disciples raise a question about suffering that they are looking at. Um, his disciples asked him about the blindness that they see in this man, um, whether it was his sin or the sin of his parents uh, that is the cause of his pain. Well, Jesus responds, it was not, it was not that this man sinned or his parents, watch this, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. Pause and read that passage. Pause and meditate on that passage. Look at your own suffering. Look at the suffering around you and consider, consider how or even if God might use that suffering. He might use your pain to bring glory to himself. Suffering can also further the promises of the gospel. In chapter 7 and 8 of the Acts of the Apostles, Stephen is martyred and martyred terribly by being stoned. All the while that this is happening, uh, the enemy of the church, Saul, who later becomes Paul, is rampaging. He not only gives approval to this murder, but he is rampaging against God's church. But in the midst of that, if you read on one more verse, nothing stops the spread of the gospel. Suffering is not without purpose in God's world. It may take effort and prayer and reflection on the part of the Christian um, to discover what that purpose might be. But it's worthwhile to see how God works all things, all things for the good of those who love him. If suffering turns out to be a consequence of sin, well, then correct that sin. If the suffering, on the other hand, appears to be without cause, well, comb the scriptures to find one of the myriad ways in which God might be using that for your good, 
or for the good of somebody else. Our finite reality requires that the purpose of some suffering in our lives, it might remain a mystery to us. And this, that thought, that thought demands a mature faith, a deep-seated trust in Christ and his ultimate goodness. As a Christian, then, what should my attitude be towards suffering? Well, first, we should be sober and prepared for the reality of suffering, both personally and corporately. Our Lord Jesus told us of this reality, and the apostles confirmed it. Um, Knowing this reality, we may not find ourselves able to be mature enough to rejoice in suffering, as Paul suggests, but we can guard ourselves from becoming uh, distraught and discouraged. A simple um, don't worry, be happy uh, attitude uh, is generally not going to suffice to bear up under any kind of extraordinary suffering. Guarding against discouragement requires understanding. Uh, It requires that we understand how God can use that suffering, my suffering, for good. Being shaped into a more refined Christ-likeness is the greatest tool we have so as not to lose heart, even when the suffering threatens to overwhelm us. Hey, thanks for watching this episode of 167. Each of these questions um, that we've addressed, it could have extended into multiple hour responses for each one. The chief point to take away from the answers to these common questions is this. The omnipotent God is in full control. We have to be cautious um, in how we form questions about God's power in relation to suffering. Can God do something about suffering? That's not the question we want to ask. What has God done in response to suffering? That's the question we want to ask. The answer, of course, is in the glory of Jesus and the promise of the restoration of shalom. You might find it most helpful when you're considering questions of suffering to work backwards from the crucifixion, the resurrection, the redemption in Jesus as you look to understand the sometimes mysterious nature of suffering in this world. Grace and peace to you.